This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 14 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kwame Genov, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash K W A M E G E N O V V. Wingy. The hours at work help to dull the acute consciousness of my environment. The hosiery department is past the stage of experiment. The introduction of additional knitting machines has enlarged my task, necessitating increased effort and more sedulous application. The shop routine now demands all my attention. It leaves little time for thinking or broading. My physical condition alarms me. The morning hours completely exhaust me, and I am barely able to keep up with the line returning to the cell house for the noon meal. A feeling of lassitude possesses me, my feet drag heavily, and I experience great difficulty in mastering my sleepiness. I have grown indifferent to the meals, the odor of the food nauseates me. I am nervous and morbid, the sight of a striped prisoner disgusts me, the proximity of a guard enrages me. The shop officer has repeatedly warned me against my disrespectful and surly manner. But I am indifferent to consequences. What matter what happens? My waning strength is a source of satisfaction. Perhaps it indicates the approach of death. The thought pleases me in a quiet, impersonal way. There will be no more suffering, no anguish. The world at large is non-existent. It is centered in me. And yet I myself stand aloof and see it falling into gradual peace and quiet, into extinction. Back in my cell after the day's work, I leave the evening meal of bread and coffee untouched. My candle remains unlit. I sit listlessly in the gathering dusk, conscious only of the longing to hear the gong's deep bass, the three bells tolling the order to retire. I welcome the blessed permission to fall into bed. The coarse straw mattress beckons invitingly. I yearn for sleep for oblivion. Occasional mail from friends rouses me from my apathy, but the awakening is brief, the tone of the letter is guarded, their contents too general in character, the matters that might kindle my interest are missing, the world and its problems are drifting from my horizon, I am cast into the darkness, no ray of sunshine holds out the promise of spring. At times, the realization of my fate is borne in upon me with the violence of a shock, and I am engulfed in despair, now threatening to break down the barriers of sanity, now affording melancholy satisfaction in the wild play of fancy. Existence grows more and more unbearable with the contrast of dream and reality. Weary of the day's routine, I welcome the solitude of the cell, impatient even of the greeting of the passing convict. I shrink from the uninvited familiarity of these men, the horizontal grey and black constantly reviving the image of the tigress, with their stealthy, vicious cunning. They are not of my world. I would aid them, as in duty bound to the victims of social injustice, but I cannot be friends with them. They do not belong to the people, to whose service my life is consecrated. Unfortunates, indeed, yet parasites upon their producers, less in degree, but no less in kind than the rich exploiters. By virtue of my principles, rather than their deserts, I must give them my intellectual sympathy. They touch no chord in my heart. Only Wingy seems different. There is a gentle note about his manner that breathes cheer and encouragement. Often I long for his presence, yet he seldom finds opportunity to talk with me, save Sundays during church service when I remain in the cell. Perhaps I may see him today. He must be careful of the block captain on his rounds of the galleries, counting the church delinquents. The captain is passing on the range now. I recognize the uncertain step, instantly ready to halt at the sight of a face behind the bars. Now he is at the cell. He pencils in his notebook the number of the wooden block over the door, A7. Catholic? he asks, mechanically. Then, looking up, he frowns on me. You're no Catholic, Berkman. What do you stay in for? I am an atheist. A what? An atheist. A non-believer. Oh, an infidel are you. You'll be damned, sure enough. The wooden stairs creak beneath the officer's weight. He has turned the corner. Wingy will take advantage now. I hope he will come soon. 
Perhaps somebody is watching. Hello, Alec. Want a piece of pie? Here, grab it. Pie, Wingy, I whisper wonderingly. Where do you get such luxuries? Swipe from the screws, poke. Cornbread Tom's dinner basket, you know. The cheap guy saved it after breakfast. Rotten, ain't he? Why so? Why, you greenie, he's a stomach robber. That's what he is. It's our pie, Alec, made here in the bakery. That's why our punk is stale, see? They steals the east to make pies for the screws. Are you next? How do you like the grub, anyhow? The bread is generally stale, Wingy, and the coffee tastes like tepid water. Coffee, you call it? Heh <laughs> heh, coffee hell. It ain't no damn coffee. Twas never near coffee. It's just bootleg, Alec. Bootleg. Know how it's made? And uh, no. Well, I've been three months in the kitchen. You collect all the old punk that the cons dump bout with their dinner pans. Only the crusts you seem, like as not some sif coon spit on it. And some's mean enough to do it, you know. Makes no diff, though. Orders is, cut off the crust and burn em to a good black crisp. Then you pour boiling water over it and dump it in the kettle, inside a bag, you know, and throw a little dirty chicory in, there's your coffee. I never touch the rotten stuff. It ruins your stomach, that's what it does, Alec. You oughtn't drink the swill. I don't care if it kills me. Come, come, Alec. Cheer up, old boy. You got a tough bit, I know, but don't take it so hard. Don't think of your time. Forget it. No, oh, yes, you can. You just take my word for it. Make some friends. Think who you want to see tomorrow, and then try to see him. That's what you want to do, Alec. It'll keep you hustling. Best thing for the blues, kitty. For a moment, he pauses in his hurried whisper. The soft eyes are full of sympathy. The lips smile encouragingly. He leans the broom against the door, glances quickly around, hesitates an instant, and then deftly slips a slender, delicate hand between the bars and gives my cheek a tender pat. Involuntarily, I step back, with the instinctive dislike of a man's caress. Yet I would not offend my kind friend. But Wingy must have noticed my annoyance. He eyes me critically, wonderingly. Presently picking up the broom, he says with a touch of diffidence, You are all right, Alec. I like you for it. Just wanted to try you, see? How try me, Wingy? Oh, you ain't next. Well, you see, he hesitates, a faint flush stealing over his prison pallor. You see, Alec, it's... Ah, wait till I pipe the screw. Poor Wingy, the ruse is too transparent to hide his embarrassment. I can distinctly follow the step of the block captain on the upper galleries. He is the sole officer in the cell house during church service. The unlocking of the yard door would apprise us of the entrance of a guard before the latter could observe Wingy at my cell. I ponder over the flimsy excuse. Why did Wingy leave me? His flushed face, the halting speech of the usually loquacious rangeman, the subterfuge employed to sweet sneak off, as he himself would characterize his hasty departure, all seem very peculiar. What could he have meant by trying me? But before I have time to evolve a satisfactory explanation, I hear Wingy tiptoeing back. It's all right, Alec. They won't come from the chapel for a good while yet. What did you mean by trying me, Wingy? Ugh, well, he stammers. Never mind, Alec. You're a good boy, all right. You don't belong here. That's what I say. Well, I am here, and the chances are I'll die here. Now, don't talk so foolish, boy. I load you look down at the mouth. Now, don't you fill your head with such stuff and nonsense. Croak here, hell. You ain't going to do nothing of the kind. Don't you go broaden now. You listen to me, Alec? That's your friend talking, see? You're so young. Why, you're just a kid. Twenty-one, ain't ya? And talking about dying? Shame on you. Shame. His manner is angry, but the tremor in his voice sends a ray of warmth to my heart. Impulsively, I put my hand between the bars. His firm clasp assures me of returned appreciation. You must brace up, Alec. Look at the lifers. You'd think they'd be black as night. Nit, my boy, the jolliest lot in the dump. You seen old Henry? No? Well, you ought see him. He's the oldest man here in fifteen years. A lifer and hasn't a friend in the world, but he's happy as the days long. And you got plenty friends, true blue too. I know you have. I have, Wingy, but what could they do for me? How you talk, Alec. Could do anything. You got rich friends, I know. You was mixed up with Frick. Well, your friends are all right, ain't they? Of course. What could they do, Wingy? Get you pardon in two, three years maybe, see? You must make a good record here. 
Ugh, I don't care for a pardon. What? You're kidding. No, Wingy, quite seriously. I am opposed to it on principle. You're sure, Bugs? What you talking about? Principal fiddlesticks. Want to get out of here? Of course I do. Well, then, quit your principal racket. What's principal got to do with it? Your principal against getting out? No, but against being pardoned. You're beyond me, Alec. Guess you're joshing me. Now listen, Wingy. You see, I wouldn't apply for a pardon because it would be asking favors from the government, and I am against it, you understand? It would be of no use anyhow, Wingy. And if you could get a pardon for the asking you won't ask, Alec, that's what you mean? Yes. You're hot stuff, Alec. What they call you, narcist? Hot stuff, by gosh. Can't make you out, though. Seems daffy. Listen to me, Alec. If I was you, I'd take anything I could get and then tell him to go to hell. That's what I would do, my boy. He looks at me quizzically, searchingly. The faint echo of the captain's step reaches us from a gallery on the opposite side. With a quick glance to the right and left, Wingy leans over toward the door. His mouth between the bars, he whispers very low, Principles opposed to get away, Alec? The sudden question bewilders me. The instinct of liberty, my revolutionary spirit, the misery of my existence, all flame into being, rousing a wild, tumultuous beating of my heart, pervading my whole being with hope, intense to the point of pain. I remain silent. Is it safe to trust him? He seems kind and sympathetic. You may trust me, Alec, Wingy whispers, as if reading my thoughts. I'm your friend. Yes, Wingy, I believe you. My principles are not opposed to an escape. I have been thinking about it, but so far, shh, easy. Walls have ears. Any chance here, Wingy? Well, it's a damn tough dump, this ear is. But there's many a star in heaven, Alec, and you may have a lucky one. Hasn't been a getaway here since Paddy McGaw sneaked over the roof. That's, let me see, six, seven years ago about. How did he do it? I ask, breathlessly. Just Irish luck. They was finishing the new block, you know. Paddy was helping lay the roof. When he got a good and ready, he just goes to work and slides down the roof. Swiped stuff in the mat shop and spliced a rope together, see? They never got him either. Was he in stripes, Wingy? Sure he was, only been in a few months. How did he manage to get away in stripes? Wouldn't he be recognized as an escaped prisoner? That bother you, Alec? Why, it's easy. Get planted till dark, then hold up the first bloke you see and take his duds. Or push in the back door of a rag joint, plenty of them in Allegheny. Is there any chance now through the roof? Nit, my boy, nothing doing there, but a feller's got to be alive. Many ways to kill a cat, you know. Remember the stiff you got in them things, towel and soap? You know about it, Wingy? I ask in amazement. Do I? Heh <laughs> heh, you little. The click of steel sounds warning. Wingy disappears. End of section 14. This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist.